that part of the world. I trust that you'll please help us in praying uh, for those places and for the needs that are there. Two or three things. One, uh, several have wondered about the uh, uh, Israeli war now with Hamas, if that will affect us. Uh, probably in time it might. Uh, but uh, at this present time it, it will not. Our churches are pastored by nationals, so they would not have to depart from the country uh, as an American missionary perhaps would. <clears throat> also, uh, they've been through a lot of those things and they know how to handle some of it. Some of it they may not, but still uh, pray for them if you would. Uh, also, there are several needs. You saw the uh, the picture of the school, artist rendition of what the school will look like in Iraq. Uh, the Lord, we felt, directed us to that place. Uh, we already had a piece of property purchased and were ready to begin building. And uh, the government changed, as it often does. And they told us that the property was too small, it's not big enough, uh, which was strange to us. So we began praying and looking. God led us to this property that we have now, uh, which is in uh, a far more visible part of the city. Uh, this is in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, very uh, highly visible area. They're, they're building an amusement park near where this property is. There's a thoroughfare right out beside it, so people coming and going will be able to see it. And uh, we were able to sell the, the uh, previous property for the very dollar we needed to buy that property. And so we felt God was in that move. And now we're just uh, uh, seeking to raise support uh, monies to build this school. It's very, very costly to build in Iraq as it is probably anywhere, but especially there. And uh, we're praying God will help. We were going to have 300 students uh, in the other property, in this property, we can have 1,500 to 2,000. Uh, and also in that building, by their choice, not by ours, but by their choice, the only language that will be allowed in that building is English uh, because they want to learn English. And so we'll start them at kindergarten and go on up. And uh, so that would allow anyone from the States that wanted to, felt God leading them to be a part of that could come and teach in our school and would not have to learn Arabic. And so, great opportunity. The church will also be located in it. The radio and video ministries will be located. We have four stations now in Iraq. We cover about 85% of the country, which is 12 to 14 million people a day in that country alone have access to the gospel every day. And uh, that's a great, great blessing. Uh, an opportunity that the Lord has opened for us, and for that we are truly grateful. Pray for the works there. Pray for us in our travels. Our next trip coming up, Lord willing, in November, December, uh, we'll be going to Egypt, uh, to South Sudan, and then probably into Iraq as well. Pray for us as we go, and uh, we praise the Lord for it. We have a need for a bus in uh, South Sudan. Pray that God will help us there. And then one of our churches uh, in Egypt, we have, we have 14 churches there, already bought property for the 15th. And Lord willing, by the end of this year, we'll have it planted. And we started all our churches from scratch. We didn't take over anybody's church. But this brother's church, uh, he took his father's place. His father was uh, killed by radical Muslims. And so he took his father's place in pastoring the church and the Lord's hand's been upon this young man, and it just blossoms and grows, and he's out of room. And so he needs to move up to the next floor uh, to put people there, and he needs a monitor and a video projector to, to, you know, to show, broadcast the service, what's going on to people up there uh, in the next floor so that uh, they can continue to grow and reach people. But uh, we'll be out at our table. If you have any questions, we'd be, be more than happy to meet you and visit and answer any questions that, that you may have. And God bless you. Thank you, preacher, for letting us share that. Mm -hmm. How many of you are thankful for these folks that 
answer God's call on their life to go where we can't go. Praise the Lord for them. And uh, we're going to uh, receive our offering at this time. And I'll ask the gentleman to come. Uh, don't, put your, don't put your faith promise card in the offering just yet. We'll collect those um, after the preaching is done tonight. And then while they count uh, the remaining uh, balance for this evening, uh, we have some missions business that we need to discuss. And we'll take care of that at this time. Let's go ahead and pray. And let's ask God's blessing on this offering this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so very grateful to hear the testimonies and presentations of every missionary that has been with us this week. Lord, I am so thankful to be a part of a missions church. Lord, I'm thankful to be a part of a church who realizes that it doesn't all begin and end here. That we must be global when it comes to the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray that as we pray together as a church, Lord, that you'll use us to be a part of what you're doing, not only here, but around the world. And we'll ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Miss Becky. <clears throat> I mentioned this morning that God has placed us on a mission field here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Winchester is a needy place that needs Jesus. And uh, God forbid we ever get to the point where we just come up here and meet on this hill and then go our ways and not ever think about that. And so uh, I want to just take a minute before Brother Ward comes and uh, just tell you some things that are going to be happening over the next several weeks. Uh, the deacons and I have a meeting this coming Sunday. I hope you'll pray for us as we meet. Uh, but uh, during that meeting, we're going to be putting some finalizations on some next steps things uh, that are going to be happening here at Lighthouse Two weeks from now, so not next Sunday night, but the next Sunday night after that, 
uh, we are going to present a next steps service uh, where we're going to lay out to you uh, what we believe the Lord would have us do. And uh, this, is, this is no time to sit on the sidelines. This is a time to advance. And uh, when we talk about stepping out by faith, that, that's what I'm talking about in some of these things. Uh, so two weeks from now, we're going to be presenting some next steps to you, uh, what we believe the Lord would have us do to increase our vision, our ministry, and our impact here in Winchester. And then two weeks after that, uh, we'll have a business meeting because some of the things I'm going to present to you are going to require us to vote on them. And so I hope that you'll be praying about those things. And uh, it's exciting that I say two weeks after that, one week after that, okay? So three weeks, we'll have a business meeting. But I want to present it to you before we vote on it because I want you to think about it and I want you to pray about it because uh, these are not small things that we're going to be talking about. These are big things that we're going to be talking about. I'm ready for some big things. I think God's ready to have us step out by faith and do them. And so I hope that you'll pray about that uh, because the bigger bird, the bigger the burden we have for our mission field, the bigger the burden we'll have for the mission fields that we're sending money to. And uh, these things that we're going to be talking about is going to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that God has opened these doors for us. Again, it is my privilege and honor uh, to present the wards to you tonight. And Brother Ward, you can come on up and uh, you preach the word to us tonight. And we're praying for you as you do that. And it's been a joy to have you with us this week, brother. God bless you. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here, be a part of your missions advance. And we are th more than honored to be here, actually. And I hope that in some way we can be a blessing to you as each of you have been and are to us. And we, we have made new friends during these uh, few days and uh, hope that we can make more as well. I uh, haven't been much in your city uh, since we have been here. I've been through here several times. And um, we uh, are traveling to point A to point B and such. But I have a childhood school friend that lives here. And I've not seen in years and years and years. He and I both grew up. We, my wife and I both are from originally from Arkansas. And um, I met this friend in the sixth grade, and we were friends on up till into high school. And then a little bit after school, when we both were out and such, but I've not seen him in a long time. But I know he lives here, and I have no way of getting in touch with him or knowing how to do so. But uh, maybe some of you know him. His name is Wayne Holden. If you have met him or know of him, I'd love to be able to see him while I'm here. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he, uh, he lives here. At least the last I heard of him, he was here. FBI may be chasing him somewhere, I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, that's, where, that's where he was. Thank you again for letting us be here. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for letting us park here. And uh, that's our home my wife and I live in that, travel in that. God gave it to us, and that's what He wanted us to do. And so, by His grace, that's what we're doing. And uh, we'd love for you to stop by anytime and see us, not all at once, <laughs> but we'd love for you to stop by and see us. And uh, just so my wife would have a heads up a little bit that you're coming. She gets a little nervous about those things, doesn't bother me at all. But uh, she gets a little nervous about that, but we'd love for you to stop by. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, we're going to begin reading there at verse 1. Read just a few verses here uh, this evening. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, 
And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save or except a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading and preaching of his word this evening. Let's bow, please, for prayer. Father, thank you for this wonderful time uh, that you've given to us for my wife and I to be a part of this great meeting in this wonderful church. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon them already. And we anticipate even more blessings in the days to come. Uh, your hand continue upon this preacher and his family, these people as they labor together. Now, Lord, in these next few moments, I pray you'll speak to our hearts as is needful. Guide my thoughts and strengthen my voice. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we ask about or think about what is missions, what would be a definition that we might would give for that answer or for that question? A classic definition uh, for Christian missions is proclaiming the gospel message outside of our culture as in going to serve at a great distance or going to a foreign land and uh, living there and reaching people as many of these brethren do and thank, praise God for them. But uh, also missions is going next door or across the street to witness to your neighbor. It's also witnessing to our family or coworker or classmates or whomever God would bring into our life to be a witness unto them for Christ, uh, for Christ's sake. Missions is basically Jesus calling us to others. We're not only called just to know him, but also to make him known uh, to those that we come in contact with. And what a great blessing that is, an opportunity. We come to this story tonight in 2 Kings chapter 4. Very familiar, I'm sure, to most of us. It's during the ministry of the prophet Elisha. Now, there was the prophet Elijah, who was the predecessor of Elisha. And then Elisha came along after him. And uh, the Bible tells us, it teaches us that uh, God used Elisha in great ways as he did the prophet Elijah. In fact, as Elijah and Elisha were walking along and Elijah knew he was on his way to heaven, by the way, we should know that as well. And as uh, they were going along, he looks at Elisha and he says, what would you have me do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha said, I want a double portion of the spirit God has placed upon you in my life. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken away, then, you know, it'll be, it'll be done, it'll be given to you. I'm sure there are those that we have met in our life, in our days that uh, serve the Lord and have a wonderful spirit and God's hand upon them. And we have also thought, Lord, I'd like just even a portion of the spirit that you've placed upon them to be in my life as well. And then no doubt there are those that we have met along the way that we would say, God, I don't want any portion of the spirit those people have. But Elisha saw something in the life of Elijah that he longed for. And God blessed him in that wonderful, wonderful way. And the Bible says during this time, as we've read here tonight, Elisha had what we would call a traveling seminary. 
<clears throat> training preachers for the ministry. They were called sons of the prophets. By the way, I believe that preachers should train preachers. I believe that's God's way. And uh, so uh, Elisha was training these men and helping them in their work. Scripture says that one of them died. We're not told what happened. If it was by an accident or if it was by some illness, it really doesn't matter. If it did, God would have told us. But other than the fact that this man died and he leaves behind his wife who is now, <clears throat> now a widow and in her life she has these two boys to raise. And in those days, a widow's life was not an easy one uh, by any means. Uh, they didn't have programs where she could go and sign up for assistance. They didn't have welfare. She was at the mercy of whoever would have compassion upon her. And so she comes to the man of God seeking help. At least she knew where to come to seek to find answers. She comes to the man of God we see in this her dilemma. She is now a widow trying to raise two boys. Her, uh, her helpmeet, uh, her provider, her protector is no longer there. He has passed off. He has gone on uh, into eternity with the Lord. And she is now left with the task of raising these two sons in a day and time when there was not much available for her to have. And uh, that's her dilemma. But not only that, we see her distress in the fact that not only is she there to raise those two boys, but the Bible says they owed a debt. They had an indebtedness to a creditor. The creditor was not a compassionate man, as it seems. He could have come to her and said, I see your situation and I understand your, uh, uh, the, the, the matter that you're in, and so I'd forgive you of this debt and go about your way and, and all would be well. He could have done that, but instead, the Bible said, he has said he's going to come and take her two sons to be bondmen, literally to be slaves, in order to pay off this indebtedness that... Uh, this family owed him. What that amount was, I have no idea. What it was for, I have no idea. But it still, it was there, a burden to them and a, a problem for her and her, her sons uh, go over. We see the direction <clears throat> that the man of God gives her. And it seems a bit strange to us when we see what uh, Elisha began to ask her and then tell her what to do. But is it sometimes the work of God doesn't it seem a little strange, some things that God asks us to do in some ways? Uh, if, if it were you and I writing the story, if it was you and I doing those things, we would not chose to do things that way. But God says, your ways are not my ways, and my ways are not your ways. And so we always do it God's way because that's the best way. And we see the direction that God gave. And this story ends in great delight uh, as uh, we'll see in just a moment. But Elisha asked her two questions, very needful, uh, very pointed, very important questions. He said, what would you have me do for you? What is it that you would want me to do for you? In other words, he was asking, what is it that you really need in your life? What is it that you need the most? The Bible says that Jesus was coming out of Jericho and as he was coming out of Jericho, as often it was, there was a crowd of people following him. On the, on the wayside, there sat a blind man named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus couldn't see what was going on, but he heard the commotion, and he began to ask people, what is happening here? What, what's going on? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. What a wonderful statement. What an opportunity. Jesus is passing by. And so Bartimaeus began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And there were those who said, you need to be quiet. You can't do that around here. We don't have that kind of church here. You gotta be quiet. And uh, besides, Jesus is a busy man and he's on his way to help some other people far more important than you. And so you need to just be quiet. But instead of listening to that crowd, he got even louder. And uh, he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus stopped. 
and commanded that he be brought before him. They brought Bartimaeus and set him before Jesus and, and uh, Jesus looks down. Bartimaeus can only hear the voice. He can't see. And he says, what is it that you'd like me to do for you? Bartimaeus could have said, I want you to take care of that crowd over there. They was mean to me. They tried to hush me up and they wouldn't help me and, or anything. I want you to take care of that crowd. Wouldn't it be sometimes we kind of wish we had this zapping power? Especially when it's busy traffic and people's driving ways are not our ways. Just zap, zap, zap. Oh, they're glad we're not God, amen? But Bartimaeus didn't ask that. He could have said, Lord, I've been a beggar all my life. Never had anything. I want this, 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 and this. But he didn't say that. He asked for that which he needed most. He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said, according to your faith, so be it. His eyes began to open, and the first thing he saw was the smiling face of the Savior. Hallelujah. Don't you know that guy jumped up and run around and hollered a bit about that and began to follow Jesus? What a story he had to tell. And what a story you and I have to tell because of what Jesus has done for us as well. And so, Elisha says, what is it that you would have me do for you? What is it that you really need? If Jesus came tonight and stood individually before each of us and looked into our eyes, into our face, and said, what is it that you really need me to do for you? What would we answer? What would be that answer? That's where God wants us to come to, to that point. But then he asked a second question. He said, what do you have in the house? What do you have in the house? Now, I would be safe, I feel safe in saying this tonight, that every man in this auditorium tonight has no clue the answer to that question. <laughs> we know where the remote is when the ball game comes on. We know where the recliner is. We know where the refrigerator is. That's a good three-pointer. <laughs> Remote, recliner, refrigerator. Put a poem with it, you got a good message. We know where all of those things are. Where the hunting boots are, at least where we left them last. We know all of those things. I used to think, preacher, that my wife hid things on purpose so that she might say to me, you can't find nothing which was about true. But the situation is now neither one of us can find anything, so we're, <laughs> we're more in a mess. But he said, what do you have in the house? And she said, thine handmaid hath nothing save or except a pot of oil. Now, that term pot of oil means anointed. It was literally an oil flask a very small container of oil. You see, her husband was one of the sons of the prophets. He was being trained for the ministry to go about and anoint people and pray for them and pray with them, and that's what he had left them. He didn't have houses and lands and stocks and bonds to leave them, and we may want to be critical, but wait a minute. Oil in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. There's not three gods. There's one God that manifests himself in three persons. And so he left them God in his home, which is far more valuable than any stocks or bonds or lands or houses or any of those kind of things. If we can teach our families to worship God, if we can teach our families to pray and get a hold of God, if we can teach them about God and to know God, we've given them something far, far more valuable than anything else in this world. And so in a sense what she was telling him, I don't have anything in the house except God. What else would you need? 
So again, a bit strange, but here's what Elisha said. I want you to go about your neighborhood to all your neighbors, and I want you to borrow vessels. Borrow not a few, borrow empty vessels. And then bring them to your house and put them in a room and shut the door, you and your sons, and then I want you to begin to pour. And so here I can see in my mind's eye, here comes this widow woman and her two sons. They probably have a little two-wheel cart pulled by a donkey, and they're going up this main street, and they're going this way and that way. And going, she's taking one side of the street, and the boy's taking the other side. And they're going up through there just asking, knocking, saying, could we borrow a vessel? Somebody say, here comes that widow woman and her sons. Wonder what, wonder what they're want, going to want. And she just says, could I borrow some vessels? What kind of vessels? It doesn't matter. The, the shape, size, depth, or anything, it just has to be empty. And I have to get as many as I can. Would you have loaned them a vessel? Would you have given them a vessel to use? Empty vessels. You see, I believe that's why God sometimes doesn't use us. We're already full. Full of self. Full of pride. Full of worldliness. And it's hard to fill something that's already full. God said it has to be empty. Empty vessels. And so she begins to bring vessels she got, and the boys begin to bring, and they pile them up on there, and they got them so high they have to hold them here as the donkey pulls a little cart, and they go back to their house. They get to the house, and one boy's in the wagon and handing down to the other boy, and he's handing to his mom. They get them all put in that room, and they shut the door, just like the man of God said. And there's three things the Bible teaches us that she did, and you have this little thought tonight. As the preacher said this morning, just a simple thought. But those are always the best. First thing she did, she poured out. Now, I don't know about you, but I know me. And I'm sure I would have had this thought somewhere along the way. I have no idea why that preacher wanted us to get all these vessels. Why we had to go and get as many vessels as we could and fill that little wagon up and bother our neighbors and do all of that. I have no idea why he wanted us to do all that because all we've got is this little bit of oil. I mean, there's not enough in this little flask of oil to fill up uh, even one of those empty vessels, much less all of them. But that's what he said. So that's what we're going to do. By the grace of God, we're going to Obey what the preacher said. That's what we're supposed to do. And so I can see them. Wouldn't you like to have been in that room? I can see them as uh, they're in there and the door's shut. And uh, she, she says, son, bring me a vessel. Brings a vessel and puts it down there. And she takes that little flask of oil and she begins to pour. And the amount in that, that vessel begins to rise and it comes all the way to the top, and I believe they got it like Jesus said, fill it to the brim. And she's looking at that vessel, and their amazement, they look at one another, and they look back, there's still oil in this vessel. She says, bring me another, boys, let's see if that can happen again. Set that in the side. And they fill that one up. Set that in the side. Before long, this gets pretty fun. And you just, just, just what? Just watching what God's doing, just, just pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and pouring out. As long as there was an empty vessel there, there was oil to pour in it. Could I ask you a question tonight? There ever been a time that you got away from everything and everybody? Shut the door, turned the phone off, and you just poured your heart out to God? Every nook and cranny, window, door, everything of your heart, you just opened it and poured everything out to God. My wife and I grew up in a country, a very rural area, in a country church. We had mourners' benches. I can remember many times during that time that people would come, somebody would just fall on their face on that, and people would just flock around them and come and fall there and begin to pray. And they'd pray and pray and they'd stay there till the thing was answered and taken care of. And when they got up, there'd be literally puddles of tears on that mourner's bench. 
And they'd be wiping tears and said, so-and-so come tonight and had a problem in the life or had a sin in the life and they've, they've got this right with God and we've just been able to come and pray. Preacher, you know how long it's been since I've seen that. God's given my wife and I three children and nine grandchildren. Our, we have one grandchild in heaven, our very first one. He would be 19 this past June if he had lived. Our next oldest grandchild is a granddaughter. She graduated from high school this past May. The next one in line graduates this coming May from high school. Not long ago she put something online that I, I saw it and I kept it and I have it on my phone and I think about it often. It was a piece of paper and at the top of the paper it said, Dear God, and in the body of the paper it just had tear splotches on that paper. And at the end it said, Amen. I can't tell you tonight how that blessed my heart. Sometimes we don't know the words that we need to say to God, but God knows them. He knows our heart. He knows the attitude and the need of our heart and life. And we just, we just come before Him and open that up to Him and pour it out to God. And God understands and knows exactly what is going on and what is needful. Just pour out. Some of us, no doubt, in this room need to have some time with God, just us and the Lord. Maybe us as a family, maybe us as a couple, maybe us as brothers and sisters, whatever, and we just get with God and we just pour out. You say, well, God already knows He does. The Bible says He knows. Before we ask, He knows what we need and what we're going to ask. But He still wants us to come and trust Him and ask. Do you need to pour out before God? She poured out. The second thing that the Bible teaches us that she did was she poured in. All those empty vessels... But one vessel after another just kept pouring it in. But there are two other vessels in that room that she was pouring something in. Very important vessels. It was those two boys, her two sons. She was pouring something into their heart and their mind that they would use the rest of their life and never ever forget. You see, one day those boys were grown and had families of their own. And I can see one of them's child come to him and say, Daddy, tell us about a time when you were a, a child, when you were young. And he'd say, let me tell you, honey, about when your granddad passed away, your grandmother and your uncle and myself, we had nothing. We had nowhere to turn. Nobody. To go. We came to the man of God and told him our need and situation, and he told us to, to go and borrow vessels, and we came, brought it into the house, and we began to, your grandmother began to pour out and fill up all those vessels, and God took care of our debt. And that child would say, is that true, Daddy? Is that a true story? He could say, I still got the Still got the oil. And one day, son, this will be yours. One day you'll have this oil. You see, my granddad passed it down to my dad. My dad passed it down to me. We passed it down to our children, and then they are passing it to their children. It just goes generation to generation. Just how to use the oil. She poured in. She poured out, and praise God, the Bible says she poured on. In your Bible tonight, you saw that statement. She said, bring me another vessel, and the boy said, there's not another vessel, Mom. And your Bible says, and mine says, and the oil stayed. It didn't say it stopped. It said it stayed. There's a difference. There's a difference in stopping and staying. 
Sometimes when I'm behind, I'm not a patient person. I'm sorry, I'm telling you some of my faults. When I'm behind somebody at a stoplight and it turns green and they not only have stopped, but they just stay and stay and stay and stay. And I'm back there hollering. Put your phone down and go on. You say, do you blow the horn? If my wife's not with me, I do. <laughs> There's a difference in stopping and staying. They were all stayed. She came to the man of God and said, all those vessels are full. He says, good, then take that that oil and sell it and pay your debt and you and your sons live off the rest. The rest of what? If all that oil is used to sell and pay the debt, well, they have left. They still have God. Now, you can't put God in a bottle. But that little flask of oil represented something that God is and God will do and how God will help us. You'll never run him out. My wife and I years ago pastored a small country church. It was called Pleasant Springs Baptist Church. A little block building by the side of the road. We were very young. We had our first child. He was just born. And we went there and God sent us there. The Lord began to save people. We didn't have a baptistry. We'd go to ponds and lakes and streams and we'd borrow, if it's wintertime, we'd borrow another church's baptistry. They came to us one day and they said, if we bought a house and moved it in here, would you live in it? Said, yeah, we would do that. This little church, you could put about half of this section, you could put everybody in it. They bought a house three times as big as that church building and moved it in there. We began to set up housekeeping in that house. They had a little shallow well that the church was connected to, and it was just to operate the restrooms, and that was it. And it provided enough of that. When we hooked that house up on that little well, I mean, it, in no time we ran that thing dry. We thought, what are we going to do? One of the men said, right out in front of the church in the house was this spring. That was why it's called Pleasant Springs. And it had a well tile right beside it, about like that, and about so big around. He said, why don't we take the pump off of that shallow well and put on that and see what happens? We did. We set it up on there. And it kept water about so far from the top. It was always there. About the first washing day that we had after we get set that up, I went out there and stood by that, that water, that well tile, and I watched. And that water level would go down, and it come right back up. It would go down, and it come right back up. It never ran dry. I mentioned to you, God gave us our, that coach out there as far as our home. My wife and I didn't know anything about that kind of living. We had no idea. We'd never done that. We'd never been camping, preacher. We didn't know anything about that. We had a lot to learn. There's a lot of adjustments at the beginning. And one thing is we began to learn that there's maintenance you have to do on those things. It has an engine. The oil has to be changed from time to time and other things that takes place on it. And so we, uh, we learned pretty quick. A friend of mine, a pastor in Florida, has one, lived in one for years. We went out there and he showed me how to do several things. So I thought, well, I could do this. This is no problem. I could do this. Next time it came oil changing time, I crawled up under that thing, got up under there and, and uh, found the uh, the uh, oil drain plug on the oil pan and I put a wrench on there and there was more of me then than there is now and I put all of my weight on that and tried to budget and I couldn't budget. I thought this is not going to work. 
I came to my wife and I said, we're going to have to go to one of the places that works on these and take care of this. It's going to cost a little bit, but it'll be worth it. We need to get it done. So we were again, we're in Florida and we made an appointment at a place that's in winter springs, winter garden, winter something Florida. <laughs> and we went there and pulled in the evening, six, seven o'clock the next morning. It was knocking on our door. They took our bus in, took it in one of those bays and put it on the lift and it was high and lifted up. <laughs> and they began to walk under that thing and say, oh, Mr. Ward. Mm. Oh, yeah, hmm. You need this, and you need this. Oh, and, and you really got to have this, and you got to have this. And all those thises came along. And by the time they were through, what was going to cost this much was out this far. And we said, we don't have, we don't have money for that. How are we going to? Well, it needs to be done. I said, well, let's try this and this and Maybe we can find a way to pay for that. We went into a lounge area that they had, a little room down here on the side, down the hallway. We're sitting there and wondering and probably worrying how we're going to pay for this. And in a moment, in walks this older couple. We had seen them pull in the day before in one of their coaches. They have several. They have two or three businesses and such. They come walking in and they sit down. We spoke to them. They spoke to us. In a moment he turns around to me and he says, are you folks retired? I said, no, sir, we're not retired. He said, what do you do? I said, we're in ministry. Well, what kind of ministry? I said, we're in missions ministry. Well, what kind of missions ministry? There's a lot of different kinds. I began to tell him where we go and what we do. And the further more I told that, the further his chin fell down on his chest. He said, you go to those places? I said, yes, sir. You yourself go to those? I said, yes, sir. We, said, we do. And he sat there and looked at me for just a moment. It seemed like an eternity just looking at you. You ever felt somebody was looking at you? And you turn and somebody's just, you know, <laughs> But in this day, we kind of like that. We got all these selfies. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm here in this room in my house now, and I'm going into that room. <laughs> and now I'm over here in this room, and this is what I'm doing over here. And now I'm going to go back over to that room. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> but he sat there and looked at me for a moment, and then he, he said, if we wanted to make a donation to your ministry, how would we do that? I began to see a little light at the end of the tunnel, preacher. <laughs> I said, well, sir, you would just give it <laughs> and we would receive it. <laughs> I didn't know any other way to say it. He looks at his wife and he says, honey, do you have a check? I'm saying, Lord, how about I have a check? How about I have a check? She said, no, I don't. I think there's one in the coach. He said, oh, I got one here. He turns around, and I can hear him scribbling on the desk and things there. He folds it up, turns around, and hands it to me. I don't know this guy. He doesn't know me. We've just met a few moments ago. He hands that to me, and I thanked him, didn't even look at it, put it in my pocket. I said, thank you, sir. God bless you. We appreciate it. We visited a little longer. We had to go somewhere. We got up and left. Well, I stopped by the men's room, and while I'm in there, I reach in my pocket and I pull that check out. The amount on that check not only took care of everything they wanted to do to our coach that day, but some things they could not do. We had to go to somewhere else to get it done. It paid for that as well. I showed that to my wife when I came out. I said, God is so faithful to take care of his home. Back in the spring, we were coming from west coast to east. We got to Gallup, New Mexico, and they closed the interstate. You had to get off. You couldn't go any further. Truck, trailers, everything was getting off. When I exited off, it was like you had a standard shift and you pushed in on the clutch, but you still had your foot on the gas. 
I got it at the end and it wouldn't hardly move. It, I barely got it enough to get it past the truck and over to the side of the highway. And there we were. We didn't know anybody. We didn't know who to call. We didn't know anything. My wife is crying. What are we going to do? I said, I'm about crying. I don't know. And so without going into every detail, we finally had to have it towed a hundred miles up the road to a place called Albuquerque and to a place there that specialized in this kind of transmission and engine that we have. And they kept it for four months. Because of the age of the bus, they don't make some of the parts anymore. They had to hunt and find them and then they had to put some new things in there. And might I tell you the price tag on that was more than my arms would stretch out. I had no idea how we was going to pay for that. I had no idea. We wondered if it was over. But maybe this is a change in direction, what we could do. But I'm telling you, preacher, God began to open up the windows of heaven. And people began to sin and churches began to sin. People we didn't even know knew us or knew about us or about our situation. And when we went out there the first part of August to pick up that bus, and they said, this is what you owe, we paid in full. That wasn't us. That was God. And I can tell you, friend, between those times and those four months, there were many times we just poured out. And God came through faithfully. God pays his bills and he took care of us. I don't know tonight what God may need to do for you, but you do. Down in the depths of your heart and soul, you know exactly what God needs to do and what you've been asking him for. I want to challenge you tonight for just a moment of your time. Just 60 seconds. You can come as long as you need, but at least a moment of your time, find you a place around this altar. And just for that moment, pour out. Pour in and pour on for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time tonight. You're so faithful, you're so loving, so gracious. And I pray, our Father, that you'll continue to speak to our hearts and meet needs tonight in this place. Maybe somebody's here that doesn't know the Lord as their Savior. Lord, whatever the needs are, I pray we'll just do business with you. Because you mean business with those that will do business. And I pray that you'll help us tonight. Bless this invitation. Thank you for extending it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we just come and ask the Lord to help us keep pouring? Can we do that? Can we just have a time of prayer together tonight?
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you will please empower us to keep on pouring. Lord, help us to have faith. Lord, help us to walk by faith and live by faith. We'll ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We're just going to take a few minutes here. If I could have our ushers, we're going to receive tonight's Faith Promise Missions offering. This morning's offering was $91,546. And uh, we're excited to see what God's going to do with that. And uh, let's just bow one more time in prayer and just ask his blessing on it, okay? God, I pray that you'll put your hand as we receive tonight's offering. And Lord, we'll do this for several more gatherings. But Lord, I pray that tonight you'll even increase what we saw this morning. And oh Lord, I pray that you will help the oil stay. And we'll ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we have an a offering taken up song? Thank you. three items of business this evening uh, that uh, we need to vote on. Uh, the first is, I believe it's the Lord's will and direction for us to partner with the Wards, the Lees, and Brother Hendricks and to support them monthly as missionaries. And uh, can I have a motion on the floor this evening that we do that, Brother John Galloway? Does anybody second the motion that we do that? Brother Mike Hicks, all in favor of taking all three of these missionary families on, would you signify, signify if I can talk, signify by an amen. 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 Opposed? All right. The second item of business I'd like to entertain, um, I believe that... Uh, well, first of all, let me just tell you, the Lord has been very gracious to us in our missions ministry and our faith promise missions. As I've said already, uh, the Lord brought in more than was committed last year in our faith promise missions. So I would like for us as a church body to send a love gift with the wards to put toward any ministry that they see fit in the Middle East. You mentioned several tonight, and uh, we would just love for you to put this towards anything that you would see fit. But I'd like to put a motion on the floor that we give them $5,000 to do that. Uh, does anybody this evening make a motion that we do that? Brother Tim Schraff. Does anybody second that motion tonight? Uh, Brother, Tas Brother Taslam? Amen. All those in favor of sending $5,000 to the Middle East, would you signify by a hearty amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Um, it is our privilege out of our 112 missionaries uh, to be the sending church of three of those missionaries. Uh, there is a difference between supporting a missionary and being the sending church of a missionary. And right now, uh, we, are, we have the privilege of being the sending church to Brother Jason Caldwell in Seeing Truth Ministries, to Brother Steve Ludwig in Rock of Ages Prison Ministry, 
and uh, Brother Craig Mason. And uh, recently, uh, I had a meeting with Brother Al Doomey. And uh, the Doomies have been a tremendous blessing to Lighthouse. And uh, they have been attending here, members here, for a long time. He came to me and expressed his desire that Lighthouse be their sending church. Now, what that means is there is an accountability issue there, but that also means we are more involved in what they're doing. And so I would like to present to the church and recommend to the church that we become the sending church to Brother Al Doomey with outreach to Asian nationals. And can I have a motion on the floor this evening that we do that? Brother Tony Stottlemyre makes a motion. And uh, let me see here. There's lots. Let me see. Who, raise your hand. Brother Ed Schraff seconds the motion. All in favor of taking the Doomies on as their sending church, would you signify by a hearty amen? Amen. amen. The motion is passed. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I believe the Lord is about ready to have us step out by faith to see some big things happen. I believe in 2024, we're going to see the oil stay. We're going to see the oil stay. But you do know that that means that we have to tilt the bottle, right? Right? And so I hope you'll be praying about that. Do we have an updated total for this evening, sir? Hey, uh, that's fine. You mean I've got to do math? I've got to do math. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Oh, this is, this is bad. All right. This is bad. I went to an ACE school. All right. <laughs> No, I got it. I was overwhelmed for a minute. I wasn't having trouble with math. I have been here for 17 years. And I have never seen a Sunday missions offering at Lighthouse like the number I'm about ready to tell you. How about for a Sunday total, $140,650? Amen. Praise the Lord. I ask God that this is the biggest missions offering that we've ever taken. Boy, that's a good start. That's $40,000 away from where we were committed last year after about four weeks after missions conference. How many of you think God's doing something? How, how much more proof do you need? So some of you are on the fence about this thing and you, you need to go all in. You need to go all in because this is not me. This is not something I'm drumming up here, okay? Believe me, you can ask my wife. I was more apprehensive about this mission's revival I and mean, this mission's advance than I've ever been before. Like, we're not prepared. I don't feel like it's going to be good. I don't feel like I've got all our ducks in a row. And isn't that amazing that that is exactly when God says, you don't have to have all your ducks in a row. 140650 dollars and all God's people said amen. amen amen brother Miller are we doing something after this service tonight okay do you do you want to come up and close us in prayer because I just feel stupid doing that okay we're gonna go out down down here and have a party for me okay I, I don't like whatever <laughs> We are having a uh, pastor appreciation uh, luncheon or dinner down here. We do have uh, some sandwiches, chips, and uh, we're looking forward to just a time of fellowship. Uh, thank the pastor, as you see, and we really appreciate uh, the pastor that he gives us for the time that he gives us to him for. Uh, uh, to him to us for and so uh, if you would please continue to pray for the pastor as well uh, and everything he deals with there and uh, do get on board uh, I hope that you're on board and uh, go all in
Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. I'm thankful for what we heard this evening, Lord, for, for uh, really from all these missionaries throughout this week, Lord. And I know uh, it's been an exhausting time, Lord, but it's been, it's been a good exhaustion, Lord. It's a good time that we have, uh, Lord, just to fellowship with other believers, those who are, have given their lives to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we've even been challenged uh, that we need to be the ones that give our lives uh, to spread your gospel, to spread your truth. And may we not hesitate to do that in our own community and amongst our own families and friends. We'll thank you for it. Lord, be with the, uh, the uh, fellowship that we're having this evening, that we'll just have a good time together. We do thank you for our pastor. Lord, continue to bless him for his sacrifice uh, in this ministry for you. We'll thank you for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.